Joshua 3, 1 through 17. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites sent out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So, when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan while the water flowing down to the Sea of Ereba, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And our second reading is Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So we started to look into the idea of what the Bible teaches us about being conquerors in Christ, and it's a theme found throughout the New Testament. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we read, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. And so we've been looking at the biblical story of the Israelite conquest of the Promised Land in order to learn object lessons to help us to live these victorious lives that we're called to in Christ. So if you remember last week, we learned the object lesson of trusting God's promises by comparing the two times spies were sent into the promised land across the Jordan. First, when the 12 spies were sent under Moses, and then second, when the two spies were sent under Joshua. And we looked at what was the promise that God made to Joshua, and God said this, Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, remember that's some 2 million plus people, plus all their flocks and herds and so on and their possessions. Cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Basically the same promise he made to Moses, and it was the promise that came from the Abrahamic covenant. And remember what he said next. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, everywhere that you're going to step in the future, I have already given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so we got to witness witness them actually trusting God's promise. Joshua 1.10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you are to cross this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And then after they went and they came back, they said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and all the inhabitants of the land, moreover, have melted away before us. So finally, this time we saw them trusting God's promise. 
And the object lesson for us was that we too need to trust God's promises because we remember as we're reminded in 2 Corinthians 1, God is faithful. For as many as may be the promises of God in Christ, they are yes. Wherefore also by Christ is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. And so today we're going to see that trust in action as they actually take that step of faith and they follow their king into the great unknown. <coughs> so the title of this morning's message is Following Your King, but the question logically would be, well, who is their king? Because what we're looking at in today's story in, in Joshua happened approximately 400 years before Saul was anointed the first king of Israel. So we're some four centuries before Israel has a human king. So the question is, who was their king that they followed into the promised land? The king of Israel always was Jehovah God himself. Psalm 1016, remember every time we see the Lord all capitalized, it's the kind of mistranslation, the, the superstitious avoiding the translation of God's covenant name Jehovah. Jehovah is king forever and ever. Psalm 47, 2, for Jehovah most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Psalm 95, 3, for Jehovah is a great God and a great king above all gods. Isaiah 33, 22, for Jehovah is our judge, Jehovah is our lawgiver, Jehovah is our king. He will save us. Zephaniah 3.15, looking towards the end of days and the day of the Lord. Jehovah has taken away his judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Jehovah, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. That's why it was so horrific, a crime against God, when the people later on at the end of Judges asked for a human king like the other nations. It was a rejection of God. And then we remember the reenactment on Good Friday. <coughs> When Pilate said, Behold your king, and what did they say? We have no king except Caesar. And that was a rejection of God himself. So the king that they were following was God himself. Remember how our passage opened up. So early in the morning, Joshua rose up, and they went to the Jordan. And then at the end of the three days, remember we just reminded ourselves that in three days they were going to cross? Three days are up. So at the end of the three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, When you see the Ark of the Covenant, your, the Lord your God, with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near to it, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. So God is leading them somewhere they have never been before. If you've never seen a picture of the ark, that is a replica of it, look like that. Levites would stand on each end with the poles on their shoulders carrying it. Remember that it symbolized the presence of Jehovah God with his people as their covenant king. Old Testament scholars, scholars of ancient Near Eastern history, when they look at the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, when they look at the book of Deuteronomy, they see a structure in it that reflects a type of treaty that was common in that part of the world at that time, and it was what's called a suzerain vassal treaty. It's where a powerful king would make a treaty with a weak, powerless nation. Rather than coming in and domineering them and conquering them, which a fierce, evil king would do, the loving king takes them under his arms and goes, enters into an agreement with them, outlining what their obligations are and what he will do for them. And so it was that form that the Mosaic Covenant took, a treaty between an all-powerful God who could have wiped out this people but instead chose to love them and embrace them. And the Ark of the Covenant represented that. And so we know what it contained. The Bible tells us that it contained the two tables of the law. Okay, second set, because Moses had his hissy fit and broke the first set. But it contained those. It contained Aaron's staff. Remember the staff he did all the miracles with? It contained that. And it contained a jar of manna, one last remnant, one last memorial of all the times God fed them miraculously from heaven. So that was the contents of it. And when we looked at the Exodus story, remember it was standard practice for them to pick that up and head out. And yes, they did follow the pillar of fire by night and cloud by day, but it was the Ark of the Covenant that led their way. So this wasn't a new thing. This was how they got to the Jordan in the first place, and this is how they're going to get across. And so that Ark of the Covenant is really symbolizing God, their king, his presence. Notice how far in front of them the king is going, 2,000 cubits. So the NIV said about 1,000 yards, and that's right, 2,000 cubits is roughly a kilometer. So just to give us a feel for that, there is our friend Google Maps helping us out. So here we are down there, that little red balloon is us, sitting right here this morning in the church. And I picked the lake, so obviously that's not a straight line, but if we were to take any of those paths, it would take us about 12 minutes. So the Ark of the Covenant was about 12 minutes out in front of the people, two million strong, plus all their possessions, heading in a march. So it's 
well out there in front. If you want to do a straight line, probably the other side of the lake. So stop and think about how far it is. They weren't all packed in together. The Ark of the Covenant went out way in front, showing it was God who was going to deliver them. It was God by himself that was going to, was going to deliver them. And so it was God himself in the Ark of the Covenant symbolically that led the way. So Joshua spoke to the priests saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant, cross over ahead of the people, and they did that. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Two million people, not all of them would have faith. And so seeing Joshua perform miracles, seeing God perform miracles through Joshua, would show that God was with him. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. So they're going to walk up to the river, the priests carrying the Ark, and they're going to step into the river. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now notice in there, let's not miss it, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. So every nation had their own gods in the time, but the God of Israel, Jehovah, was not their national God. He was the true God, the God of the universe, the God of the whole entire world and the universe and all peoples. He's going over ahead of you into the Jordan. And it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. So they're going to pile up. So that was the promise to lead the way, and the Lord did exactly that, and he opened the door. So it came about when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, that the waters were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap, a great distance away at Adam, the city that's beside Zarethan, and those which were flowing down toward the Sea of Ereba, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite the Jordan. And we need to visualize what's going on. When we looked a few weeks ago at what were the obstacles standing between the people and the Promised Land, you had a river there, and now most of the time we saw the river's not all that wide on average, about 10 feet deep on average, about 100 feet wide, not really that gigantic, still problematic for 2 million plus people and all their possessions. Then across the river, you had the fortified city of Jericho, double-walled, and armies with chariots. It's kind of problematic when you're on foot carrying swords and spears. And then you had all the Canaanite people in the land as well, who were second only to Egypt at that time for power. So the best of times, this is a challenge. But it wasn't the best of times because right here just happens to be the time when the river's in flood stage, not unlike what we're seeing in northern British Columbia right now. You have to see the Jordan in flood stage to picture what they were up against. There's a couple of pictures of the Jordan in flood stage. So this is what they were walking up to. So imagine you're one of those priests with the pole on your shoulder carrying the ark, and that's what you're supposed to step into. So it's not some peaceful little creek that you're going to step into, nicely dip your toes in to make sure it's okay. God's calling you to walk into that. So how much faith is that going to take to walk into that? This is kind of frightening. So why did God pick the most treacherous time of the year to send the people across? To show that he's God. Because at that point, when the river's the most treacherous, when things are the most dangerous, that was when God could clearly show his mighty power. And that was going to test the faith of all the people. But keep in mind, it was not just going to test their faith, it was going to strengthen their faith. And those two things are inseparable. We cannot grow in our faith if our faith isn't tested. Because as God puts us into situations like crossing rivers like this, figuratively speaking, we have to trust him. We've got to step in. And when he delivers us to the other side, our faith is strengthened as a result of that. So our spiritual journey is full of impossible to cross raging, treacherous rivers that are placed there by God to show us that he is God. Now, where they crossed was roughly somewhere down about here. Remember, they were camped over here. So you can see how the valley floor spreads out, and at places the river can be over a kilometer wide at flood stage. There's Adam up towards the north, towards the Sea of Galilee. The water's flowing down this way towards the Dead Sea. <coughs> Not only did God pick the most difficult time of the year to send the people across in the Promised Land, he picked just about the most difficult place to cross and probably about the most frightening place to cross. Because all around here, you've got marshes and mud flats. So try and walk your herds and flocks through the mud flats. We all know what, what it's like trying to get through mud around here. So you're doing it on foot, two million plus people. But it's worse because the river looks like that. So it would have been easier to cross in all kinds of different places, but that's not where God had them cross. It was there. 
And what is right across the river? Jericho. You think everybody in Jericho couldn't see what was happening? So over on this side, you've got two million Israelites following the ark into the raging river. On this side, you've got all the inhabitants of Jericho. Everybody's watching what's about to happen. And what's about to happen is that's not going to be there anymore. So think about the object lesson in here. Think about how terrifying this was going to be. Remember when the spies went to Jericho, Rahab said the people's hearts had already melted because of what God had done for them before. She had more faith than Moses did in God. And so now right in front of their eyes, the raging Jericho is going to separate and two million plus people are going to come marching across straight towards them. It's going to terrify them. But how about if you're one of the Israelites? You're kind of looking, river's piled up about 18 miles up that way. It's piled up on that side and you're thinking, is this really safe? Is God really going to hold this there? It's a point of no return. You have no choice. Nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. You have to go across. You have to keep going. And so, of course, they did. But let's look at what the real miracle is. Okay, so the people crossed opposite Jericho, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan. Will all Israel cross on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan? So they all got across, all two million plus of them and all their possessions. Things like this, miracle stories in the Bible, people often try to explain it away. From time to time, the cliffs to the north of the river, so we go back to our... So cliffs off to the north up there, sometimes the time landslides, earthquakes cause them to flow, into the, flow down into the river, and they temporarily dam the river. For example, in 1927, roughly at about the site of Adam, which was referenced there, that happened and the river was dammed up for about 21 hours, but then the water erodes its way through and it opens back up again. So it's not an entirely unheard of thing for banks to collapse on the Jordan and block it up temporarily. So there are people who say, well, that must be what it was. There was an earthquake and, and the river was blocked up in a perfectly natural explanation. But every time we come up with a natural explanation for some miracle in the Bible, basically what we're saying is, well, God didn't really do it. Something else happened and God's just taking credit for something he never did in the first place. So just to make sure we can't sit here today and say, well, it was just an earthquake that did that. Notice how God had them cross on dry ground. So where it was marshy and mud flats and the waters had parted and the bottom of the river was all mud, it wasn't when they crossed, it was dry ground. No earthquake's going to explain that. No damming the river temporarily for a day or two is going to explain that. So the real miracle is not just the water piled up and stopped. And that's the other thing. They saw the wall of water. They didn't see a wall of sand. They saw a wall of water. But that aside, they crossed on dry ground. That was the miracle. So no matter how you look at this, there is no natural explanation. The explanation is God, that God did this. And two million plus people were witnesses to that. So what's the application for us? Well, in parallel, let's remember who our king is. A couple weeks ago, Palm Sunday. Zechariah 9.9, we always read that, Palm Sunday. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So when Jesus sends the disciples off to get the donkey and it comes back and he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that's in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. But notice who it is that's coming, your king. Well, who is the king? The king is God himself. And we know that's the story of Christmas, that Christmas is when God became flesh and dwelt among us. Remember Nathaniel when he met Jesus, he said, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. He's God and he's king. Think about how the Bible describes Jesus when he returns, Revelation 19.16. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's our king and that's the one we follow. And just like God through the Levites, through the Ark of the Covenant, really through himself, but with them symbolically, opened the door by parting the waters of the Jordan so the people could cross on dry ground, Jesus, our King, did the same thing. He opened the door for us. In our second scripture reading this morning in Matthew 3, which was the baptism account of Jesus, and we don't want to get sidetracked by all the details that we could get into on this. We just want to focus on a couple of things that are directly relevant. But reading it again, Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. So this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered, saying to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And there's a whole variety of reasons why Jesus was baptized, and there's a whole variety of significances that tie into that in our baptism. But just focusing on the connections between this and the story of the crossing of the Jordan. After being baptized in the Jordan, Jesus went up immediately from the water, 
And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove. Remember our call to worship this morning, Isaiah chapter 11, talking about the root of Jesse, the shoot, the coming Messiah. The Holy Spirit would descend upon him. And that was the theme throughout the book of Isaiah, that that would signify who the Messiah was. Notice also we see the entire Trinity in this story. Because we have Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit is settling on him like a dove, and God the Father speaks from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Think about how the Bible describes our union with Jesus. We're baptized into him. So outwardly our water baptism signifies that, but inwardly it's the baptism by the Holy Spirit. That's why the, body, the Bible talks about us being baptized in water and in fire. And so it's through that we're united together with him. And when we are, what do we get? The promise of God, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And what are we made? We're made the sons of God. And remember, we talked about this before, we are all male and female sons of God, and that's not a gender thing, it's not a misogynistic thing. It was a legal thing, that in that time, only the sons had rights as heirs, daughters didn't. And the Bible says in Christ there is no male nor female, we're all joint heirs, we are all, figuratively speaking, sons of God and equal in Christ. And so all of these things are embodied within this baptism. So when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, he blazed the way for us as our king. But let's notice where it was that he was baptized. We don't know the exact spot, but what we know is, coming from this way, it would be somewhere on this stretch right here. And does that look familiar to you? Right? Jericho wasn't there at the time of Jesus, but for context, Jesus was baptized roughly the same place that the Israelites crossed. Now, two million people, it would have been a fairly wide march. Which way did they come from? They came from the east and headed to the west. The Jordan opened up, the Ark of the Covenant went through, and through they went physically into the Promised Land. Which way did Jesus come? Already from the promised land. Let's go all the way back to where did he come from? He came forth from God because he was God and he came to earth and he became one of us. And then as that, he came from the east to come and collect us into the Jordan to open the way for us, to bring us back with him into the promised land and ultimately the spiritual promised land. A couple of years ago at Christmas, we talked about the theme of Traveling west, remember back of the garden, which way were they booted? Out to the east. Kicked out of the Garden of Eden towards the east. Which way did the wise men come? They came to the west. Which way do you enter the temple of God? From the east to the west. So there's a very strong symbolism there. So Jesus enters into the Jordan from the east, already in the promised land, to grab us, take us by the hand, and lead us spiritually through the Jordan into the spiritual promised land. Because after all, in our King we are conquerors, but thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. So what do we take away from this? Well, just like Joshua was called to lead the people in the conquest of the promised land, physically, Christ is our conquering King and in Christ we're called to conquer in Christ. So that everywhere we go, Jesus will live in us. Everywhere we go, we can be the sweet aroma of Christ. So we're going to have these things in our way in life as we're walking along. Again, imagine trying to just step your foot in that. Go ahead, step in and trust me, is what God is saying. Remember the time the disciples were all in the boat, fierce storm, ready to capsize the boat, and Jesus was sleeping, and they woke him up and said, Master, why are you sleeping? Don't you care? And he stilled the storm. He did care. He was there with them. So we often find our spiritual journey blocked by raging, flooded rivers that are impossible for us on our own. Could be health issues, could be sin issues, could be various trials that we go through. But whatever these rivers are that we face that we just cannot get across on our own, even though we can see the promised land is just the other side, we have to remember those rivers are put there by God, God who loves us, God who is sovereign, and God who is our king so that he can show us that he's God, so that he can show us his love, show us his faithfulness. And in the process, our faith is going to be tested, but it's only as our faith is tested that it's strengthened. And so our theme of this whole entire series is conquering Christ. And remember who this Christ is we're conquering in, Revelation 17, 14. Speaking of when he returns in the nations, they'll wage war against the Lamb. Now here's a kind of a paradox in images. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is the conquering warrior and the King of heaven. These will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and he is King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful, and that's us, and we're with him. We're with our conquering king through all things. And so Jesus could make this promise, John 16, 33, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. That's a fact. But take courage, because I have overcome the world. 
And so we're going to close by reminding ourselves that we need to follow our king. 1 Peter 1.18, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from our, your fathers. Think about how empty life can be. Think about the things we get sidetracked in. Think about how we get our eyes taken off of Christ. And if he had bought us with a lot of gold, that would be impressive, but he bought us with his own blood. He died for us to redeem us from that life. So he's leading us out of it. He's leading us out of that old futile life. It's with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And so when we face those rivers and the water's piled up on both sides or when we have to step our foot into the raging rivers, Hebrews 7.25 reminds us, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Just like God interceded to part the Jordan, just like Jesus interceded to calm the storm on the Sea of Galilee, and just like he intercedes in everything we're going through. And sometimes we have to struggle through the storm to make it out the other side. Sometimes he picks us up and carries us. But he always lives to make intercession for us. And we need to take advantage of that and come to him and pray for that intercession. And so, just like they were looking 12 minutes ahead, the Ark of the Covenant marching in front of them, we too need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne. And as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we then will have the faith to cross through that raging river, no matter what it happens to be, because we're not looking at the river, we're looking at Jesus. And he's the one who's going to get across to the other side. So our song of response this morning is a song where we're looking at Jesus, our high King of heaven, and we're fixing our eyes on him, knowing that through all things, through the good and the bad, and even into all eternity, he's going to bear us safely along. And that is, Be Thou My Vision. So let's stand and join together singing, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs>